try it now. Okay. Okay. Joshua 10, and we are at verses 1 through 15. As soon as Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, heard how Joshua had captured Ai and had devoted it to destruction, doing to Ai and its king as he had done to Jericho and its king, and how the inhabitants of Gibeon had made peace with Israel and were among them, he feared greatly. Because Gibeon was a great city, like one of the royal cities, and because it was greater than Ai, and all its men were warriors. So Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, sent to Hoham, king of Hebron, to Piram, king of Jarmuth, to Japhia, king of Lachish, and, and to Deber, king of Eglon, saying, Come up to me and help me, and let us strike Gibeon, for it has made peace with Joshua and with the people of Hebron, uh, people of Israel. Then the five kings of the Amorites, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jarmuth, the king of Lachish, and the king of Eglon, gathered their forces and went up with all their armies and encamped against Gibeon and made war against it. And the men of Gibeon sent to Joshua at the camp in Gilgal, saying, Do not relax your hand from your servants. Come up to us quickly and save us and help us. For all the kings of the Amorites who dwell in the hill country are gathered against us. So Joshua went up from Gilgal, he and all the people of war with him, and all the mighty men of valor. And the Lord said to Joshua, Do not fear them. For I have given them into your hands. Not a man of them shall stand before you. So Joshua came upon them suddenly, having marched up all night from Gilgal. And the Lord threw them into a panic before Israel, who struck them with a great blow at Gibeon, and chased them by the way of the ascent of Beth Horn, and struck them as far as Azekot and Machedah. And as soon as they fled before Israel, while they were going down the ascent of Beth Horon, the Lord threw down large stones from heaven on them as far as Azekah, and they died. There were more who died because of the hailstones than the sons of Israel killed with the sword. At that time, Joshua spoke to the Lord in the day when the Lord gave the Amorites over to the sons of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, Son, stand still at Gibeon, and moon in the valley of Ijalon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stopped, until the nation took vengeance on their enemies. Is this not written in the book of Jasher? The sun stopped in the midst of heaven, and did not hurry to set for about a whole day. There has been no day like it before or since when the Lord heeded the voice of a man, for the Lord fought for Israel. So Joshua returned and all Israel with him to the camp at Gilgal, the word of the Lord. Father in heaven, we lift up your word to you. We pray that you by the power of the Spirit would bless the word of God to us, give us understanding, give us grace to do the things in your word that we need to do. Please help us. We truly need your power, your grace, your assistance. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Every year we see God's power in the changing of the seasons. I think we notice this best in spring, okay? Uh, as plant life becomes vibrant with color, right? The trees, the flowers that come out, the bushes. Uh, God makes known in this part of reality his providential care for creation. And most clearly, in his word that tells his story, the true story of the glory of Jesus Christ our Lord. This narrative of salvation history includes people like you and like me. We're part of his story. And so were Joshua 
and the people of his time, part of the story of his glory, the true story of his glory in Jesus Christ. Joshua is a large figure in biblical history, striding from the exodus out of Egypt to the entry and conquest of the promised land. Joshua had a heart for God. Here's a man who truly loved God with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength. He was a man of faith uh, who lived according to God's word. It was important that he was because his mission was so very difficult. Uh, what do you want me to do, Lord? Well, you have a group of uh, around 2 million people. Yeah, I see that. That's pretty big to handle. Uh, they've been wandering in the desert for uh, 40 years. Yeah, I, I know that. I've been wandering with them. Uh, Joshua, you're going to lead those wandering nomads in conquest of the land that I'm going to give you. Uh, are you sure, Lord? You know, these people don't know how to fight. Well, this is your job, Joshua. Welcome to the company. <laughs> in addition, Joshua had you know, a very difficult assignment. Who was Israel's leader before Joshua? Moses. Okay, Moses, that great servant in all God's house. And here is Joshua having to come in and follow the big man to fill the big man's shoes. Now, if anybody knows, this is a rather tough job to do. Uh, the first leader of our country was George Washington. Okay. Uh, the second leader was a very intelligent man, a trained lawyer, uh, brilliant, served our country in many ways. His name was John Adams. <laughs> it wouldn't have mattered who you put in <laughs> office after George Washington. Okay, there was going to be problems. And John Adams say, had his fill of them. It's tough to follow a larger than life figure. Joshua is a picture of Jesus Christ who leads his people not into the promised land on earth, but into the promised land of eternal life. And so we can see uh, echoes, images of Christ as we look into Joshua and see Joshua. The book of Joshua is the first of the second section of the Old Testament scriptures in Hebrew called the prophets. Okay, the prophets had two parts, uh, the former prophets and the latter prophets. Here, Joshua leads off the former prophets, and then there's going to be Judges and Samuel that we're just finishing reading, and then Kings. The former prophets tell us the history of God and his people from the entrance into the land to the exile from the land. Okay, that's the purpose of these four books. The book of Joshua presents much information about the promised land that the Lord gave his people in fulfillment of covenant promises made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, the structure of the book is built completely around the land. You have crossing into the land, chapters 1 through 5, taking the land, chapters 6 through 11, dividing the land, chapters 12 through 22, and then serving the Lord in the land, at chapters 23 and 24. So very easy to outline Joshua. Uh, what are some important ideas in this part of the scriptures as God is presenting who he is and what he does? Well, first of all, the Lord, meaning Yahweh, 
the I am is supreme over all. Okay, that's a great idea in this book. We must live in the way that God instructs us. I might say this again, but I'll say it now. We must do God's work in God's way. Okay, that's something to remember. You always do God's work in God's way, even if it doesn't make sense to you. Okay, who has not known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor that he should instruct him? You know, you just listen to what God tells you to do and you do it his way. <clears throat> A man by the name of Hamilton wrote this. This book is written from the perspective that there is none like Yahweh, that his holiness will be vindicated against the idolaters of Canaan, and that his mercy will be shown as Israel inhabits the land. And so we have the story of God's glory through salvation by judgment. We see salvation and judgment in this book of Joshua. Secondly, the Lord has power to fulfill his promises and to enforce his will. God has that power. The Lord wants us to know his faithfulness to his word. He tells us, trust me. Trust me. I have more than adequate power to do everything I have said, you trust me, okay? Now, some of that, it's not going to make sense to Israel at first. They have to live by faith, and then they see the display of what God is able to do. That's how God works, you know? He wants you to trust him, and then he takes care of the details. Uh, one church I was a pastor and needed a new boiler. You know, they owned the building, the boiler was old. And uh, how are we going to do this? What are we going to do? Well, how about we trust God and rely on him to send in all the money we need for the boiler? Well, it's an awful lot of money. What are we going to do? Trust God. Five weeks, all the money was in. Five weeks. It's a good chunk of money, too, because that was a big building. You trust God, and then you see God work in his power. You know, you don't wait to see God's power, and then you trust him. You have to trust him first, then you see his power. Thirdly, the Lord wants us to grasp that the story of his glory in Christ progresses until it reaches his goal. Getting his old people into the land was so very important. But then, when they're in the land, they had to live in that land to bring glory to the God of the land. In the words of Francis Schaeffer, Joshua is about the flow of biblical history that God didn't stop his story with Moses, but it's going to continue through Joshua's life. And you get to the end of the book, and Joshua is looking forward to what God will still do. Okay, So that's an important idea in Joshua. The Lord wants us to know that his plan progresses in stages. It moves from the now to the not yet. There, that's a whole class in seminary to get those two points, the now and the not yet. And we see the start of that here in Joshua. Fourthly, the glory of the Lord can affect different people in different ways. Wow. Consider just two examples from this book. The Lord showed grace to the outsider Rahab. And she was outside, outside, okay? But judgment to the insider Achan. Jeez, 
Sometimes that doesn't make sense to people. God blesses those on the outside and he judges those on the in. Yes, that does happen. Uh, therefore, we can see that the heart of a person is more important to God than the ethnic heritage of a person. It's heart over heritage, always. So let's look at the, this book up through chapter 10. See, this is a different kind of expositional preaching. We're just no, not looking at one little passage. We're looking at a mega part of a whole book. Okay, so some of it will be moving quickly. In chapter 1, verses 1 through 9, God's helping Israel enter the land, and he reassures his new head servant with a great promise, Joshua 1.5. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Do you know what that is? Yeah, but do you, do you know what that is? That's the strongest promise in the whole Bible. It's repeated in Hebrews 13, 5. I will never, no, absolutely ever leave you or forsake you. And God said that there to Joshua, I'll be with you. I'm not going to leave you. And he follows that up with, what about your life then? Be strong and courageous, for you will cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Now what must you do? This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate it on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. So God makes a promise, and then he says, now here's your responsibility. And the way to the fulfillment of the promise was through the steps of his own responsibility. See, there are things that God wants us to trust him for, and then there's things that we must do. It's like that old song, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Okay, you, you must have both of those things. They have to be connected in our lives. So think on that. Then we see the terror of the Lord on the nations. Oh, chapter 2. Well, you could have a few messages on chapter 2 about Rahab and the spies and just everything that God did in the life of this outsider. Uh, Rahab hides the spies, tells them of the fear of her people, and then the spies promise to rescue Rahab and her family. There's a big point here. God welcomes everyone to turn from their sins and to trust in him for salvation. You know, even like an out outsider like Rahab, God says, you trust me, come on in. Welcome. Come and welcome to Jesus Christ. See, that's what we always say. It doesn't matter where you've been or what you've done. That does not matter. What matters is where you're going. Okay. And God offers grace, forgiveness, restoration, whatever you need to get you to where you ought to be going. Okay, so all that is very important. Then the Lord makes a way across the Jordan River in chapters 3 and 4. How the Lord made the way across? Well, a couple things involved in that chapter as you read it. He used the Ark of the Covenant. What's the Ark of the Covenant? Now we know the covenant, the two tablets of stone are in the Ark, but what was on top of that covenant 
a gold mercy seat, right? And from that gold mercy seat, what could everyone see? The cloud of the glory of God. Okay. And so God tells Moses, I want you to have the priests, actually the Levites, you know, carry the ark into the Jordan, and then I'm going to do something miraculous. So I'm going to stop all the water flowing downstream. Okay. And then you're going to be able to cross on dry ground. And I'll be with you. See, he's promised that already, right? He's going to be with them. I'll be with you. All Israel will be able to see the sign of my presence there in the middle of the river, and they can all cross on dry ground. Dry ground. And, but they... They must keep a safe distance from my presence, right? Because this is old covenant. They, they can't go right up to that ark, okay? No, 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 no. Uh, you just read in 2 Samuel about what happened to Uzzah when he reached out to touch the ark and steady it. No, you don't do that. Uh, it's only in the new covenant where we get the great, draw near, draw near, come near. Let us go boldly to the throne of grace, right? The book of Hebrews encourages us in that way. So th that's one thing to notice here. The water's piled up in a heap upstream. That must have been something to see. Now, when they crossed the Red Sea, what happened? The water's piled up on both sides, right? Uh, here, they just pile up on one side. Both cases, they can walk through on dry ground. Here's another little idea It's called that we see in the Bible. It's called continuity and discontinuity. Continuity, they cross a body of water on dry ground. Discontinuity, they do it with God using a different plan. Okay. We see this continually in the Bible. The reason that God made them cross this way, well, the Lord did this, and you read this in Joshua 3, 7, he did it to show his people that he was with Joshua. Okay. It's like God's validation of Joshua's leadership of the nation. If Moses got you across the Red Sea, Joshua gets you across the Jordan River. Validation. It's also a validation of his relationship with them. Uh, you can read that in verse 10. You know, I'm with Israel. But God is doing more than that. And this is a good idea to know. You know, in any event, God can be doing multiple things, you know, and we might think, well, this is why God did that. Well, that might be the case, but he might have been doing many other things at the same time. Uh, don't try and over-categorize what God is doing. Uh, he'll beat you at that game every day. Because a third reason here, uh, he did it to demonstrate to all people groups everywhere that his hand is powerful. You want to know how powerful? I can get my people across any body of water I wish on dry ground. And if you need to walk across some body of water on dry ground, God's going to give you, get you across as you trust in him. But you must trust in him. The designed outcome was for Israel also to fear the Lord always. Secondly, in chapters uh, uh, from 513 through 927, we see that the Lord gave victories while the people failed. Oh my, oh my. This is our life, isn't it? Yeah, have you had a perfect week of victories yet? I, I haven't. <laughs> 
okay? Uh, your lives go up and down, up and down, don't they? But, you know, every time I go up, he's faithful. Every time I go down, he's faithful. And he's faithful to bring me back up. And when I go down, he's still with me. He says, now, please get your act together here, okay? <laughs> but I am with you, okay? Uh, and that, that's what we see in this large section. You know, God's telling his story with his people, you know? And we need to see that God knows who we are as his people. And he has this in his word to understand it that we might grasp how he interacts with us. And yeah, there's times when it's tough love and it's time when it's very tender love. Tough love, tender love. Uh, again, that's, we need to learn to be discerning in our uh, counseling with people because every Christian has to be a counselor, you see. But sometimes it's tender love and sometimes it's tough love. Both things have to be happening. God did something that no one expected here. God sent a special leader before they attacked the first city, Jericho. Joshua is out there. He sees this man. Are you with us or with our enemies? Neither. <laughs> I'm here as the commander of the Lord's armies. And you better take off your shoes because you're standing on holy ground. Who showed up? The pre-incarnate Christ. The Son of God. Okay. Taking angelic form in that case. And he is there. Uh, you know, Joshua was the leader, but God is the leader. We got that? You know, both those things, concurrent realities. And so here's Christ showing up to lead his people. You know, Father in heaven, I want to do this. <laughs> I want to, you know, go ahead. You know, th this will be a good picture in Joshua of what I'm doing through you. God devised a strange battle plan for Joshua. There was nothing in this plan, there was nothing in this plan that could defeat a great walled city like Jericho. What's the plan? How are we going to take the city? Well, for six days you walk, walk around it once each day. And then on the seventh day you walk around it seven times. And blow the trumpets, have the people shout, Every the walls are going to fall down. Oh, yeah. <laughs> if you know the history of siege warfare throughout human history when there were walled cities, it could take years, years for an army to conquer a walled city. God says, I'll do it in seven days. This is going to be fun. <laughs> you guys just go out. You do what I tell you to do. And then you just shout, and the walls are going to fall down. I'll give you the city. Okay. I never thought of doing it that way, Lord. No, because you never thought of my power. Okay. We're talking about my power. It's not the, you know, the tramping of their footsteps that bring down the walls. It, 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 things just don't happen that way. This is an act of... Of God. God honored Israel's promise to Rahab and her family. All the walls came down except that one place where Rahab and her family were. You know. The waters covered the whole earth and destroyed all that had the breath of life except for the one place in the ark, right? 
and you have the whole waters of the globe tossing here and there and there everybody in the ark is fine nothing's going to tip that ark over right here nothing's going to take down that part of the wall they could went with battering rams against it and that's staying up because God honors promises and they made a covenant with Rahab and her family and God kept his covenant promise. Notice how God is in perfect control of his power. He can pull down a whole city's walls and keep safe his people at the same time. Uh, you shall not be afraid of the terror by night or of the arrow that fl flies by day, right? Psalm 91, you trust in the Lord always. Trust God, especially when your world seems to be collapsing around you like Rahab could see all those walls. She had to trust God at that point. Uh, she is in the book of Hebrews, uh, you know, in the faith chapter. Right, think about that. And chapter 7 is one of the sad chapters in the Bible. Very sad. It's about the sin of Achan. He disobeyed God's command to take nothing, nothing from the defeated city. But as, when Achan is found out by God clearly directing the casting of the lot, so it falls finally on Achan, right? Uh, power of God again. And Achan makes known the tragic sequence of his disobedience. And that's a lesson to all of us. Achan said, I saw, I coveted, I took, I hid. That was the sequence of his sin. And that's the sequence whenever we sin in some way. I saw, I coveted, I took, I hid. Uh, Adam and Eve in the garden, what do they do? They hide, right? All that, we can see guilt, okay, coming out. They have to hide. You know, we can learn from that tragic sequence. Achan and his family were executed, verses 24 and 26. Why did all of them perish? You've got to be able to answer a question like this. You know, why did all of them perish? It was because they were under the law covenant. And as Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 3, 6, and 7, the law was a ministry of death. Okay, the law could never bring life. It could only execute death on the disobedient. There's another sense. We can only understand this when we comprehend the exceeding worthiness of God you know and we're in humility before him if you try and look at this starting from people starting from humans you're always going to be wondering why did God do that if you look at it from God's standpoint you say Yes, this is about my glory, okay? And so we have to understand the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, or we'll never be able to grasp this. This is something that the church in our day must return to. Not just singing glory, 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 and all kinds of praise songs. They better understand what glory means. It's about God's surpassing value his ultimate significance. And there's a lot of professed Christians in churches having struggles over a chapter like Joshua 7 when they should say, whatever you do, oh God, it's right. Whatever you do, you're holy. End of discussion. God is holy. Second, 
since God is the greatest, to sin against God is the ugliest, most terrible thing you could ever do. You have to understand that God is great. Then we see the Lord gave victory over Ai. What was the problem? They didn't do God's work in God's way. Okay, we'll just say that about it. And then whenever they repent, they deal with the sin problem. God says, I'm going to give you victory, and here's how you're going to do it. There aren't going to be any walls fall down this time, Joshua. You are going to set an ambush. We're going to do things differently this time. This is an important biblical idea. You cannot put God in a box. You know, just because God does something in a church down the street or in another state doesn't mean he's going to do the same thing here. We all got that? You know, God, God just doesn't want to be told what to do. He's God. He enjoys being God, okay? He enjoys variety. Look at all the different faces he made in this one little room. You know, he enjoys variety. And by the way, God likes your face even if you don't, okay? <laughs> just take good care of your face. Deb, I think someone's at the door. Uh, so, God did something different. Okay. And then we see in chapter 9, what happened? They failed to inquire of the Lord. Okay. Yeah, they get this delegation of folks from Gibeon, which they assume is a far-off city because the people proved it to them with all the worn-out clothes and the moldy bread and everything. You know, this must be the will of the Lord because it looks so right to us. You know, They just go by human senses. Well, there's a lot in this book, isn't there? You know, a lot of teaching points. Uh, Israel had learned the hard way about making war God's way. Okay, at Jericho, right? Everything happened. Now they're going to learn in the hard way about making peace when they don't do it in God's way. You know, there are traps for us on the right and for the left, you know, Never think that uh, you can just get in problems by going in one direction and then say, I'm going to stay away from that. And whoa, you go into a ditch on the other side. Uh, walking the Christian life is like uh, uh, traversing the edge of a razor blade. You know, you can get cut by falling off in either direction. Uh, don't be le lethargic, but neither should you be overzealous. We, we could go on and on. Pray without ceasing? Yes, but you better work hard with your hands, right? Yeah. See, there, there's a lot of things. Uh, it's complex, the Christian way of life. That's why we need the power of the Holy Spirit. Though the people of Gibeon deceived God's people, they did it because, they say in verses 24 and 25 of chapter 9, they feared the Lord. Uh, they did not have the scriptures like Israel did. Uh, they did things in the best way, and God was merciful to them, okay? Even though they are going to pay for their deceit in the long run. Uh, we can only 
grasp God's message when we understand all of his glory. You know, sometimes very precise, sometimes very merciful. Don't try and predict how God's going to interact with you. Okay? Uh, you just don't know. Then in chapter 10 that we've already read, the Lord shows his great power. This is maybe besides Genesis 1 and Luke 24 and the other resurrection accounts of Christ, this probably is the greatest account of God's power in the whole Bible. Uh, the Lord and his people were opposed by the nations. Uh, their fear drove the nations in the wrong direction. Instead of acting like the Gibeonites, Gibeonites and seeking peace in some way, uh, suing for peace, saying, Lord, we'll leave, don't kill us. You know, they don't do any of that. They gather their armies. We're going to beat God. We're going to beat Israel. And don't throw down that challenge before God, because God, you throw down the gauntlet, God will pick it up. And he says, yeah, okay. Uh, you, you want to tangle? I, I'm in, if you're in. Don't do it. Don't do it. It's a poor plan. So, Joshua and his people had made that treaty with Gibeon, right? Well, what do they have to do now? God's people have to keep their word. Does you understand that? God's people have to keep their word. You know, we have agreed together as a body of believers we're going to support the work of Christ here in West Norriton. You know, well, God giving us grace, we have to keep the word, right? There's a paper over in the church office that hangs there showing some of us were charter members, right? So we have to do what we can. Uh, Israel had to go there. Faithfulness is part of our sacrificial love to our neighbors. The Lord expects us to keep the covenants we make, whether with him or with people or with our spouses, right? You know, sometimes you keep a covenant for a long time. You don't even realize it when you're 21, 22. Till death do us part. As long as we both shall live, right? In sickness and in health, in poverty and in wealth. A lot of life is comprehended in those statements. And we keep our covenants there. Just saying. The Lord controls his creation. We see this in two ways in this event. First, the Lord sent huge hailstones to destroy the enemy. Now, this shouldn't surprise us. He had promised Israel the victory, so he sends these huge uh, hailstones. God's in control of creation. He can do anything he wants. And there's a two-part miracle here, not only sending the hailstones to destroy the enemy, but also, those hailstones do not hit his people. So many examples of this in the Bible. God can send rain on one field and not on another. He tells us that in his word. Uh, if things are happening in your life, <clears throat> God has a reason. They're just not random events. Uh, you don't judge other people for the things that God is doing in their life, by the way. Okay? Uh, Lord, whatever you're doing there, I'm going to pray for my brother or sister or these people who don't know you. Yeah. Uh, I'm not going to judge them because of what they're going through. <clears throat> you, you just don't know that. If I'm saying God is working in an event and we need to seek him during those times because he's in control and some things will hit some Christians and not hit others 
anyone here ever hear of COVID? <laughs> you know, some pe good Christians got sick with COVID and died. Others did not. Most others did not. Uh, we, we can't discern all that. That's between that person and God, what happened. Uh, but this is what God did. <clears throat> the one who could make the water of the Jordan pile up in a heap and not run wild in other places could surely direct every hailstone that fell. No problem. Mercy and judgment happened here at the same time. Judgment on the armies who opposed the Lord and his people. Mercy to the armies of Israel. Right in the same event. That we often see. Then the Lord made the sun stand still. Joshua was running out of time. You know, well, the sun's due to go down here very shortly. He's looking, looking at his eye watch there. And, yeah, I, I, I see that. Uh, Lord, I need some help here. Uh, I don't think you've ever done this, but could you stop the sun from going down? Yeah, in this case, Joshua, I'll listen to you. Now, we don't ask the Lord to stop the sun in its course as we talk every day. The Lord might want us to get up earlier, to work more efficiently. Okay, you go down the list. You know, as one man once said, no doubt the trouble is with you. You know, don't be <laughs> saying, God, I, you got to bail me out. Yeah, I, I, I've been pretty good at that. But, you know, get to work. But here, okay, Joshua, this is a great opportunity to uh, just display my power. And the sun stopped for about a whole day going down. And it's, it's just there. It's, do you realize all the miracles of physics that had to occur at that one moment? Uh, why do we have this marvelous thing called gravity? Because the earth is spinning, right, at this ridiculous speed that I've been used to my whole life, right? And it's just going, and, and God stops the earth from spinning. You know, when the sun stops, that's what he's really doing, right? And everything that's connected with that in global physics, God has to have his hand on. Uh, the rivers flowing, the tides, Right? He has to hold all the tides in place. There, there's just so much going on uh, in that day. And, okay, you got the job done, and God restarts everything. It's marvelous, a, a great display of his power. And that's why we call this message the power of God. The power of God. Joshua it was just like you and me. He could do nothing like that. Have you ever stopped the sun from going down? Uh, me neither, okay? Just haven't done that. I was talking to somebody one time about Jesus calming the sea. And a person said to me, I don't get it. Why is this important for me to know? I said, can you do it? And this person said to me, I think I'm going to start reading the Gospel of Mark all over again. <laughs> and the person became a Christian after that. There's one greater than Joshua that can stop any son, send hailstones where he wants, knock down any walls as much as he wants to. Okay. Take a young guy like Joshua, who's now 85, and get him going uh, to lead his people. And the name of that person is the Lord Jesus Christ. 
God welcomes everyone to turn from their sins and to trust in him. Trust God, especially when your world seems to be collapsing around him, you. We can only grasp the Bible's message when we know the glory of God. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Joshua prayed that, and God heard his prayer. There are things that God can do that are far beyond all we can ask or imagine. And that we see that here. And if you don't know the Lord, turn to Christ, because he's the all-powerful Lord of creation. Father in heaven, we ask for your blessing to us from this book of Joshua. May we lay hold of the things that you have for us here. Lord, we pray wherever your word goes out and might go out with power that you would use your word for the salvation of many people through Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.